At around 4.30 p.m. on June 3, 1968, an angry Valerie Solanas, radical feminist and writer, walked into Andy Warhol's office with the belief that he was going to steal the script for her play and shot him. Three bullets left her 32 Beretta. The first two missed. According to Blake Gopnik, Warhol fell to the ground, cowering. Solanas eventually got close, pressed the gun to his right side, just under his armpit, and fired. The bullet pierced Warhol's stomach, liver, spleen, esophagus, and lungs. Solanas also shot art critic Mario Amaya. Amaya was only lightly wounded. Solanas killed Warhol that day for a brief moment, but it would take 19 more years until he died. One day in winter, there was a group of children who invited a boy, one of their friends, to come along with them. But this boy was slow and clumsy. He tried to pack up as quickly as he could. He picked up his books, his drawings, his knickknacks, but he misplaced something, a certain object which he wasn't entirely sure he even knew why it was important to him. The other kids got swept up in conversation and left the shelter without him. By the time everything had been organized, his friends were already far away. It was getting cold and night was approaching, so he hurried as much as he could. He knew it was his fault for falling behind. He still desperately wanted to make it, but the weather got steadily colder and the night grew darker. The children became just a tiny image that faded from view. In 2019, I entered my freshman year of college. I wasn't super social, but I made a few friends in the classes I took. Or at least, we grew to depend on each other because of how difficult those classes were. I had made no friends in the entirety of high school, so for me this was a big step up. I was talking with people of both sexes. I was living by myself with relative confidence. I was being challenged in a way that I had never been at any school before. I was starting to gain hope that finally, I would have an academic experience that wasn't dreadful in every way. Then, a few months later, outbreak in Wuhan city and it's from the same family that caused the deadly SARS epidemic 17 years ago. It's a new Any type of arriving from Wuhan, China will be screened for a fever and symptoms that are usually associated with concern for many of us overseas the situation now there is all the United States drastic new measures are being put in place to the United States and the United for the past two years, the world has become objectively more isolated. For two years, the population has been encouraged to socially isolate from one another. This caused an increase in mental instability, stress, anger, and of course, feelings of loneliness. While these guidelines are still gradually being eroded away, as schools continue to run unimpeded, as people have started to go out and interact in large groups more and more, and mask usage is declining, the effects of that period are still with us. And to some, the eroding of these guidelines is a big mistake. The scary thing is, when the world was in the depths of all this, there was a common sentiment I was seeing everywhere online. Not much has changed for me. When people say this, they aren't talking about masking up or social distancing. Clearly, that has changed for everyone. What they mean is that the intensity of their seclusion hasn't changed. I was basically in the same boat. I'm still in that same boat. This is a long boat trip, baby. Even though I was making progress in my freshman year, I hadn't laid down any foundations just yet. I could easily shrink back into talking to no one and nobody would care or notice. I have been socially isolated for a great deal of my life, mostly by choice. But then I ask myself, why is that? How come I keep failing to launch? How come I can't move on to the next stage of life that everyone else seems to so easily slide into? Then a horrifying thought comes to mind. What if it's, paradoxically, the very thing that has allowed me to express myself to hundreds of thousands of people? Now, let me be absolutely clear here. My continued seclusion is not entirely my fault, or entirely because of one factor. The COVID-19 pandemic greatly stifled my social progress, and there wasn't anything I could really do about that. 
The fact that my university kind of gave up on trying to teach students in any meaningful way, and instead often opted for professors linking YouTube videos to watch and making you do worthless assignments writing the equivalent of filler text instead of ever even bothering to record a lecture of themselves speaking is, let me see here, criminal? Pathetic? The fact that the schools I went to, both private and public, treated me like a dangerous sociopath because I didn't talk much, the fact that I was punished for anything that did not conform to strict modes of self-expression, the fact that I wasn't very keen on introducing myself to the class, playing completely ineffective socializing games, or participating in group therapy sessions in a poor attempt to replicate natural bonding so that I inadvertently learned to treat socializing as an even more awkward and painful experience than it actually was, maybe had something to do with it. But if I'm being honest with myself, I am a compulsive loner. I don't like most people, and I like to be alone, and I think that's by nature. If the internet did not exist, I would be watching movies. If movies didn't exist, I would be building, playing with Lego, and drawing. If those didn't exist, I would be reading and writing. If that didn't exist, I would be gathering resources and hunting game by myself in a savanna or something. This is just a part of who I am. But everything must be in moderation, and the year and a half I spent in isolation during COVID was not moderate. I had reached my limit. Near the end of it, by the time I was making monumentality, I could feel myself losing my mind. I was getting irrationally angry at the smallest of things. My health was in decline. I felt miserable. But I had the internet, and I had this channel. Is the internet just television? On the one hand, obviously not. There are many differences between the two, but the most substantive factor is this. Interaction. People can make posts, start discussions, like and dislike, well, like, and make critical comments, donate money, go onto weird websites, and most of all, it allows for people to meet through screens anywhere at any time. It allows everybody, even the most socially inept, to express themselves. In this sense, people who manage to gain a following use the internet like a video game, learning the rules and accumulating points. But on the other hand, is the internet really all that different from television? In essence, I mean. For a great majority of people who use social media, interaction with others is limited. Maybe you have heard of the term friendship simulator. It's been used in reference to a lengthy live stream, video, or podcast where someone watches a group of people do things that would not be all that different from having friends. Commentating on a video, playing a video game together, laughing and talking about whatever topic that comes to mind. This term is usually applied as a joke, but not really. Because for many, this kind of content really is like having a friend group, just one that you can rarely, if ever, participate in yourself. Yes, an internet celebrity may reply or like your comment, or even feature a post you made, but this interaction is far from anything like a real friendship, even if, for a brief moment, it feels like one. It is very strange for me to have experienced both sides of this. Before I made this channel when I was very young, I would admire certain Let's Players and commentary YouTubers, and on at least one occasion I got a tiny acknowledgement from one of these creators, probably a like on some fan art I made, and it was thrilling, for a minuscule moment. It didn't really mean anything after that, now I'm at a million subscribers with six years of YouTuber experience behind me. I've gotten thousands of complaints and compliments, hateful messages and heartfelt messages. When someone sends me a comment or an email thanking me about how much they love my videos and the good work I do, I'm grateful of course, but God, I hope this doesn't sound mean, but I have no idea who you are. I wish I did so I could figure out what it is that made you react to my videos in this way who you are as a person to get you to this point where you would take time out of your day to send me a comment of gratitude. But you know, I don't want to ask you a bunch of personal questions, and you don't want me to ask you a bunch of personal questions, so if I do reply, I either like their comment or give a feeble thank you, because I can't think of anything else to say. Neither of these interactions I would consider socializing. They're too brief, too alien. They're really not that deep. I'm also exceedingly glad that I haven't had any insane fans that I know of. I've seen so many enormous YouTubers with just the most dedicated, uncomfortably obsessive fan bases, and that stuff freaks me out. Now, clearly I'm biased, 
But when I look over at Twitch streamers, I get this impression that the kind of fan bases cultivated there are a little more hectic, to put it nicely. Since Twitch streamers are usually far more in tune with their audience than YouTubers, they often read usernames, respond to people in chat, and since they're streaming in real time often for literal hours, then yeah, I can easily see how someone could think of that streamer as their friend, and a reliable one at that. More reliable than a friend could ever be in reality. And the fallout of this relationship can get very uncomfortable. I especially feel bad for female streamers who have to deal with this because, let's face it, if a random lonely guy is spending hours every week watching and listening to you, that's going to screw with their head, and bad things will happen when inevitably they realize they're never going to get anything back. And then these streamers have to uncomfortably navigate through the full force of bottled up male entitlement. These streamers often find they have to disclose their relationship status so that people don't stay around expecting to get some kind of romantic reciprocation, and even then this doesn't completely stop them. There's a popular term for this kind of thing, parasocial relationship, where one person extends emotional energy, interest, and time, and now worryingly money, and the other person is unaware of the other's existence. Except that last part is only partially true in parasocial interactions on the internet as they can sometimes result in the niche internet micro-celebrity acknowledging the other person briefly. The bottom line is, there is no meaningful reciprocation. The parasocial relationship is an old concept. Before the internet, they used to occur, predominantly, around television. People have reported developing a kind of friendship with people like Oprah Winfrey or Ellen DeGeneres, the kinds of people that would regularly be on the TV for decades. They are fully aware of the illusion of these relationships, and yet feel all the same. Believe me, I would much rather take the internet over television. I haven't watched TV regularly in five years, but occasionally when I'm at a hotel that has cable, I'll switch on the TV to see how it's changed. And God, every time I forget how awful the advertising is. It really feels like 15 minutes of show and 10 minutes of ads. I can't believe I used to sit through the same loathsome collection of obnoxious, repetitive, try-hard skits for that long. It should be illegal to subject the population to so much audio-visual torture. But when the shows do come on, there's also a sick enjoyment I feel. A kind of guilty pleasure in how completely I can surrender myself to just sitting there, doing nothing. Just like finding a good series on YouTube or a live stream I happen to catch at the right time, I enter a state of complacency, as close to not thinking as possible. Here, everything is a flat imitation of life, and it just feels better this way. While great chunks of my experience on the internet has been an imitation of interaction, I've been able to actually interact with other people both in real life and through chat rooms. There was always that potential for social interaction through the technology itself that television has never had. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the opportunities that this tool has given me. But the internet can never be a replacement for social interaction. It can never be a replacement for this fundamental aspect of existence. Meeting someone in person, speaking with them face to face, and getting involved with their life. So let me ask you again. Is the internet just television? What else are you really doing besides just sitting there, consuming? For people who don't have the resources or the means to have any other kinds of relationships, don't let me discourage you. The world is a brutal place. But for those who do, I know this might be coming off as cliche, or God forbid me sounding like a boomer, but you need to get off your ass and go outside for your own sake. When you are alone with few people to interrupt your life, to make you do things, you end up in these cycles. When I find myself crossing these oceans of isolation for a few months in a row, the days just all start to melt into one another. I fall into these routines and I'm sitting there living the same day over and over again. It's a rigid structure without meaning, repetition without rhythm. The cycle just continues and all you want to do is break it. But the cycle has so much momentum. You push and pull, but you just can't break it. A long time ago, the internet used to be a brief escape from this cycle. More and more nowadays, people seem trapped in it. Maybe you haven't noticed, but people haven't been very happy on the internet recently. 
The news is constantly full of heartbreaking stories. Every aspect of our society is constantly being deconstructed and criticized. Technology seems to be hindering us more than helping us, and the state of the media we used to consume for escapism is now crumbling before our very eyes and cannot restrain itself from badgering us with the most ham-fisted social messages I have ever seen. And my god, the endless war of the sexes is just miserable. How many times do I have to see posts about what's wrong with men, what's wrong with women, he cheated, she cheated, why, why are, are women, women like, like this? this? Both of you are looking at skewed, highly selective point and gawk social media posts that highlight the worst of the worst. These anecdotes are not indicative of reality whatsoever. No one is talking to each other in these posts. No one is gaining insight. The relationship between men and women is not getting better here. I think about these problems, and it just keeps wrapping around to this question. Did the internet cultivate these people? Have we always had this many problems? Or are there more problems now? Have there always been certain percentages of the population with insane ideas that have never before been self-published publicly and at this scale? Like, it didn't used to be possible to tell thousands of people you were lonely. That just seems like a paradox. When was the last time, pre-internet, you could complain, openly, unashamed, and anonymously to hundreds of people that you were angry you were a virgin? Today, you can open up the equivalent of people's diaries and often read things they would never tell anyone they know in the real world. And yet we have no understanding of each other. We still constantly bicker over nothing. There is this illusion that when someone posts frequently, the audience knows them, even knows them well, but trust me, you do not. You are looking into someone's curated clips of their life. Do not make the mistake that the creator you like is some paragon. The likelihood that they hold a belief you don't is very high. This is one of those great differences between the internet and real life. You are being shown a filter of a filter. Despite being able to open the equivalent of people's diaries, these are still curated diaries, and people are arguably more apprehensive about posting their true feelings than they were 10 years ago, because the internet is considered a serious place now. You can't edit a face-to-face -face conversation. What you see in real life is the real deal. Wait a minute. That's not true at all. When Andy Warhol was rushed to the hospital after being shot, he was pronounced clinically dead. It took 20 minutes for an ambulance to arrive at the scene. It would take another five hours of surgery to save him. After surgery, he had to wear a corset to support his abdomen for the rest of his life. This event impacted him physically and mentally. He became much more guarded, more nervous, and more business-minded. He abandoned filmmaking and much of what people would consider his controversial art and controversial people. He wrote in his diary, I said that I wasn't creative after I was shot, because after that, I stopped seeing creepy people. He also developed an intense fear of hospitals, causing him to delay gallbladder surgery for a few years. When the surgery was finally performed, he went into cardiac arrest and died. Valerie Solanas died from pneumonia about a year later. The reason Solanas had suspected Warhol of stealing her play, Up Your Ass, is that he had misplaced the script and couldn't return it to her when she asked. Up Your Ass was found by the Andy Warhol Museum years later. Her most famous work, The Scum Manifesto, Society for Cutting Up Men, is still published today. The way I see it, there are roughly four levels of understanding a person. The first level of understanding is realizing that the thing across from you, yes, that sentient being, has the capacity to think in the exact same way as you. You feel, so you know they must feel. You think, so you know they think. When given the exact same information, it is possible for them to come to the exact same conclusions as you. This may seem obvious, but believe me, I've seen people completely fail to apply this basic fact when angered. The second level of understanding is realizing that who you are trying to understand inevitably has different life experiences from yourself. So even though you may have the exact same information, you can come to different conclusions. The third level of understanding is realizing that someone with roughly the same life experiences and same information as you may not think in the same way as you at all. 
They may have completely different moral foundations, their personality may lean in slightly different directions that drastically affect the decisions they make over time. The very circumstances of their birth might make them think in ways totally alien to you. Like, my god, men and women have seemingly infinite differences in thinking, at the most subtle of levels. We don't all see the same colors for Pete's sake, there is no universally shared experience for anyone. The fourth level of understanding is realizing that even if you accounted for personality, moral foundations, memories, genetics, and an endless myriad of conscious variables, there are still plenty of unconscious and subconscious variables that you could not even hope to understand because the brain is a horrifyingly complex environment we have barely even begun to map out and it's all hopeless. You can't get into anyone's head. You can never even know who someone is. Language is an incredible tool that allows us to unzip packets of information about the world through shared agreements of meaning across thousands of words, and yet it's still so hard to express anything, especially to those you care about. I think it might just be damn near impossible to actually get into someone's head. You will always be alone. This is something I've grown terrified of. There are biases about the nature of existence everyone has that are absolutely horrifying when they are laid bare. We assume being trapped inside singular minds is natural because that's what we're used to. Mentally healthy people have to trust that the person next to them isn't thinking about killing them at that very moment because that's the default. Because what is the likelihood that someone is thinking about that? Well, like I just explored, People don't think the same. Social people occupy themselves with the illusion of intimacy. Not that much different from watching a Twitch streamer or the TV. People know each other by what we choose to share and to hide. But we're really just alone and fragile minds traversing through a vast, cold world. What is the phenomenon of liminal spaces if not an expression of the terror, comfort, or foggy memories of isolation? Or if these were places that had social gatherings in them, those gatherings are long gone. Malls used to be social hangouts for teenagers and young adults, but that kind of activity has steadily been decreasing with the rise of dead malls. Shopping malls with high vacancy rates or low consumer traffic, or are falling apart in some way. The reason for this increase in ghostly structures has less to do with online shopping, as many may believe, and more to do with economic decline and demographic change. Now these malls are sources of nostalgia, and funerals to yet another space that while completely unnatural and drenched in consumerism, was a place where people still did things together. Edward Hopper is proof that estrangement and loneliness within urban spaces has been around for a while. He is the master of rendering figures in perpetual wariness and isolation. Multiple figures can exist in the same space, but they don't seem to speak to each other. They gaze longingly out windows, and their limbs are held close to their bodies. They are huddled up in comfortable stillness. Absolutely no one wants to touch each other. If these places seem liminal, that's because many of the paintings shown here are ones he made while traveling. All of the scenes he paints are dreamlike in a signature, off-putting way. Details are simplified and flattened into blocks of color. Windows sometimes appear to simply not exist. There is no reflections or changes in tone that would traditionally signify glass, as if the open spaces within these buildings are just architectural anomalies. Most of all, the figures seem off, appearing like mannequins stuck in mid-motion, but to say this is to imply they are not human. On the contrary, I think these figures are more human than most representations in art history. I would estimate more people feel like automatons than would like to admit. There is plenty of value to be found in Edward Hopper's quiet explorations of isolation, but few artists manage to capture the terrifying nature and beauty of it as well as Caspar David Friedrich does. The German Romantic landscape painter is most famous for this image. While a brilliant expression of self-reflection in the presence of the sublime, it's pretty optimistic compared to some of his other works. His winter scenes are, in my opinion, far more powerful. There is frequently at least one figure in his landscapes, but at first glance you're unlikely to spot them, because they are usually tiny, delicate human souls, traversing a vast and unforgiving world. This work was destroyed by fire in 1931 at the Munich Glass Palace. All we have left is this black and white photo, but that hardly diminishes the impact of the painting. 
The original was likely nearly as colorless. Nothing in these scenes is inviting. The trees are desolate and twisted and gnarled. The ruins can provide little in terms of shelter. The fragile figures trudging through the snow seem on the verge of collapse. Notably, the figures are always facing away from us and looking out. The world stretches on and on, and only the eyes of dying men are there as its witness. Friedrich had many encounters with death as a child. His mother died when he was seven, and later several of his siblings died, notably his younger brother who he watched fall through the ice of a frozen lake and drown. One must always tread carefully when attempting to make a connection between mental health conditions and creativity. In fact, Friedrich's multiple depressive episodes he experienced throughout his life are associated with diminished or altered creative outputs. But I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest that his experiences with death and depression likely influenced his personality and his areas of interest. Especially when for much of his life he was a loner. A type of person who by this point we've grown all too familiar with. He once proclaimed, In order not to detest people, I must eschew their company. Later in life, he would become even more reclusive, and would die in relative poverty shortly after suffering a stroke. Despite the works shown seemingly containing repetitive motifs and uninviting minimalism, there really is a great diversity of paintings he made. It isn't all just doom and gloom. Some people can be alone and comfortable for a long time. It is tempting to fall into that television-watching soupiness, that mentality of giving up and never developing your social skills, letting yourself fall into a cycle. But it will not last, and when it gets bad, it falls apart. I do not like socializing, and I especially do not like beginning to socialize. People will tell you, build up social skills, you practice and it gets better. Those people are lying. At least in my experience, the pain and exhaustion only diminishes slightly, and beginning a conversation never gets easier. The playing field just gets a little more known. You start to gather data and form expectations, and when you try it again, you have a better idea of what you're in for. I would guess that's by design, too. It's not good to be super open with everyone. Sometimes you need to be wary of certain people. But this survival mechanism gets kicked into overdrive and the risk of getting hurt weighs so heavily in your mind that you're paralyzed. I consider loneliness one of this generation's greatest struggles. Whether our institutions have failed us, or it was always going to be this way with the advent of social media, this is something we're going to have to break out of on our own. It is a sad fact of the world that if I were to mention all the cases of extreme social isolation that have existed, we'd be here for days. I could mention how there are estimated to be over half a million hikikomori in Japan, for example. Yous who have withdrawn from society altogether and live in homes with their parents or by other means. Or I could mention the entire incel movement, which is just an abject tragedy no matter how you slice it. But what else is there to say, really? Yeah, people are suffering. Yeah, it sucks, but oh well. The game of life is harsh and they don't want to play. Who can blame them? There's always something playing on the TV anyway. What would Andy Warhol think about today? The widespread use of the internet, TikTok stars, influencers. It really is amazing how many people are famous now and how many times that 15 minutes of fame has rung true. When you read about Andy Warhol's life, it's kind of shocking at first, but then it really isn't. Andy Warhol was one of the most influential artists of all time. He was a creative and a mover, the likes of which few other artists have come close to since. And yet for all his power, his prestige, his fame, he still suffered. He suffered so much. He had all kinds of anxieties, health problems, relationship problems. He was lonely. He was astonishing because he could turn these weaknesses into strengths, into a part of his character. But some weaknesses can fester and grow despite all your efforts, and sometimes they end you. Andy Warhol once wrote in his diary, Before I was shot, I always thought that I was more half there than all there. I always suspected that I was watching TV instead of living life. People sometimes say that the way things happen in movies is unreal, but actually it's the way things happen in life that's unreal. The movies make emotions look so strong and real, whereas when things really do happen to you, it's like watching television. You don't feel anything. Right when I was being shot and ever since, 
I knew that I was watching television. The channels switch, but it's all television. I do have friends, and ever since people have started meeting in person physically, I have made an effort to go outside and talk with people more, but I constantly fear my efforts are in vain. About a year ago, there was a brief, special moment when I thought I could escape the prison of my own mind completely. What ended up happening was a painful, year-long experience, full of frustration and disappointment. A brutal learning curve I will not forget about anytime soon. It's better now. But I still chase that moment every day of my life. When I hang out with people, sometimes I have fun, sometimes I don't. That's just how it is. But I rarely learn much about anyone on a deeper level, even if I've known about them for a while. I try to engage, God knows I try, but time and time again I interact and nothing feels real. Nothing feels real in the way I was taught things should feel real. I certainly don't blame anyone in these scenarios. I'm willing to bet half of this is entirely my fault, but I'm a limited being. Sometimes you can't see the obvious mistakes you're making. Sometimes I find myself just sitting there again, watching, occasionally speaking, but mostly watching, and then usually there's a TV around and I see the TV and it's advertising some piece of crap or showing some generic drama and then I look back at the people I'm trying to interact with and it's the same thing. It's television again. It's all just television. I have not experienced anything close to the trauma of getting shot and I hope I never have to. But when I read this quote about television, I'm floored every time. It just seems so true. It's as if Warhol hacked my brain from across space and time. But that of course is hubris speaking again. I'm not unique. He was simply a great artist. Maybe I've misinterpreted what he said. Maybe he would have hated how I'm using this quote and what it means to me in my petty personal life. But this quote is, without exaggeration, one of the most profoundly accurate things anyone has ever said. I have always felt like this. I have always been like this. If you don't believe me, look no further than this letter I wrote to myself 10 years ago. This is real, by the way. Dear L, how's it going? You probably can't understand or read most of what I'm saying. I had a low opinion of my future self, I guess. So do good on your grades, please. Do that worksheet. If there is a voice that tells you no, listen to it. Dear future self, I'm going to tell you the 10 things you must and mustn't do that I know from the past. Number 10, you hated many certain people. Number nine, when a war strikes, dig a hole and hide in the bunker. Yeah, some of these aren't going to really make sense no matter how much I explain them. Number eight, don't do drugs. Reasonable advice. Number seven, I'm in the sixth grade when writing this. Number six, on June 4th when the eclipse comes, hide in the bunker. Yeah, I'm going to skip some of these. Number three, don't smoke. Number two, don't get married. Number one, you do not believe in love. Are you guys familiar with self-fulfilling prophecies? More and more I've come to learn that the very state of our mind can play a big part in determining what our futures will be like. If you can tell from these letters, I was a troubled child, overly concerned with work, the apocalypse, and being emotionally distant from everything. When I comically write down in a letter to my future self, you do not believe in love, I am preparing myself to always expect failure. I held steadfast in this belief for a long time, 99% of the time I still hold this belief, and I think that what we experience as love are just delusions on a sinking ship, a survival mechanism 
where no one can actually be satisfied because we are fundamentally competitive creatures, and people inevitably grow tired of one another over time. Relationships of all kinds never live up to the lofty expectations society sets up for them. If anything, 11-year-old me was accurate. The question is, am I going to let a child dictate my future? This is a message for all introverts. Going out there is going to be painful. It is going to hurt a lot. It is not some cakewalk, and it doesn't suddenly get better. But sitting there rotting away with no impact on the world besides staring at little entertainment modules on a screen? That's no way to live. Be prepared to hurt, but when it comes to life, what doesn't hurt? You will try to connect. You will try to understand. You may never will. But you have to try. You have to try and break this cycle. I'll probably go out again trying to connect. I'll give you guys an update if I do. Because what else am I... What else are you supposed to do? There isn't anything else you should do. There isn't anything else you can do, but substitute the guaranteed meaningless suffering for the potentially meaningful suffering. Because sometimes... You aren't just watching TV anymore. There are rare, precious moments where you're actually experiencing something. Where you're fully there. If I could go back in time to about a year ago when I thought I had a chance at breaking my isolation completely, I wonder what I would tell myself. Would I say, don't waste your time trying? Or dream big. It's time to turn off the TV. Sometimes.